Okay, so today we are going to talk about um, a topic that we entitled Model Driven Discovery. So what this is about is to act on the failure modes of prediction of a model and try to figure out systematically why it failed and actually generate experimental hypotheses that are then pursued to try to uh, eliminate that failure of prediction in a model. So the first thing we're going to talk about here is the fact that models can't drive discovery. Of course, uh, in other fields, this has been accepted for some time. Models through computation can suggest inconsistencies in your knowledge and lead to experimentation. Genome scale science, of course, that's not been uh, widely accepted because of all the complexities and the high dimensional data sets that we have. But the genome scale reconstructions actually enable this to happen, and we'll talk about that conceptually. And then we'll talk about some details of um, how we predict missing reactions and try to figure out um, uh, if that's uh, correct by doing experiments. And also missing gene functions. As you know, for most genomes, a pretty large fraction um, of the annotated genes there have no functional annotation. They're just placed on the genome, but what they do is not known. So there are different ways of uh, uh, getting at that. It turns out to be easier in, um, in prokaryotes and archaea than uh, eukaryotes because of the organization of the genome. Okay, so we are talking about basically cat camp design of experiments, right? You actually try to compute based on a big model and a network uh, what is missing uh, in, uh, in a reconstruction. So let's first talk about what kind of gaps we can have. So here's a figure with six panels that shows different scenarios. So in scenario A, we have a perfect situation where we know everything. We know a gene, we know a transcript, we know a protein, and we know a reaction. And this is certainly true for uh, many genes and, and many reactions, and we have a lot of GPRs that represent that relationship. But this is not always the case. So in panel B, for instance, you may know that there is a reaction that takes place, but you have no idea which gene is responsible for that. And the example we highlighted on that in the E. coli lecture was lysine biosynthesis. E. coli makes lysine. We didn't find three of the genes uh, at that time for the pathway, but we still place the reaction in there because we know these reactions take place. Um, so that's one uh, uh, type of uh, you know, missing information. Panel C shows uh, the opposite, where you uh, uh, basically have a gene on a, on a genome, but you have no idea what it does. So you need to figure out its entire function. Um, Panel D is a little um, maybe uh, less common, but you know there is a reaction that takes place in a supernatant, and, and you don't even say in a cell extract or a supernatant, but you still don't have a protein. You have nothing. You can't even purify a protein that carries out the reaction. Uh, so I guess that's been called uh, orphan metabolites. We're not going to talk much about that. So orphan metabolite has no connection with uh, any macromolecule. I should say, though, on that one, uh, just to emphasize again that the correlation between the proteome and the reactome is tough, and that's the one that we need to work on a lot in the future. <clears throat> and maybe in future versions of this lecture or gap-filling algorithms, we will have protein structural information to help out with that, this step. Panel E shows something we're going to talk about, biological gaps. And they are of uh, two types. There is a true biological gap. We just don't know. Something is really missing. Um, uh, we, uh, we, well, we don't know what's missing, or something is really missing. Um, and there is something called a scope gap, because there has to be a boundary to a reconstruction, and you can only predict up to that scope. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. OK, so then the panel here to uh, your right illustrates this concept of an iterative uh, workflow that systematically discovers things. And this was actually put forth uh, in um, 
Nature, uh, in uh, Marcus Kohler's paper in Nature in um, uh, 2004, and I believe this was the first clear articulation of this type of a discovery process. So what's shown here is a starting state in a loop that is to the left of that loop, and then you get data and you try to compare the uh, properties uh, of your model represented by a, a, a solution space here, and you may get inconsistencies. You get data points that are inconsistent with that uh, solution space. And then you try to figure out why that's the case, and that often uh, is done by shaping the solution space so that these experimental points are now accounted for. And you have to normally add to the uh, reconstruction when you do that. And that then leads to an update and uh, the next iteration or the next version of the model, and you could uh, continue to go around and around uh, in principle. That has not happened yet. People have not gone around and around. But there are plenty of examples of one loop of that uh, iterative workflow. All right, so let's um, <clears throat> briefly review what kind of gaps we uh, run into. And the two, two uh, common types are shown uh, here. So in panel A, <clears throat> we show a missing reaction. So there are some reactions that may lead up to a metabolite, and then there is nothing, and then there is maybe potentially another part of the pathway shown to the right where there's a starting metabolite and there's a bunch of reactions that can act on that. But there is a missing uh, link between those two. We don't have a reaction. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, below, we show a similar situation where we actually have a complete pathway, but it's like with that lysine a biosynthetic pathway in E. coli, we don't have all the genes, and we need to discover the genetic basis for that pathway. So these are two types of gaps uh, that we might have in a reconstruction. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about discovery reactions first and then genes. Um, so um, the panel A on the previous slide illustrated what are called dead-end metabolites. There's a dead end in the network. Either there is a, a, a path to a metabolite, and there's a dead end, and that's called a, a root no-consumption metabolite. It's there, it's produced, but it's not consumed. So there's a missing consuming reaction, but it's a dead end. And then there is the opposite, where there is a root no production metabolite. That's when you have a metabolite and you can make something from it, but there's no way to make it. So there's a missing, missing path to forming that metabolite. And as you can imagine, when you start computing with a model that has these gaps, there will be a lot of re reactions that are never operating because they lead to that dead end or from that dead end. And those are called blocked reactions because they will never be used in any simulation. Uh, because of that gap. So that's uh, some, some, uh, uh, some definitions here. Now, let's talk about the reasons for gaps. <clears throat> so there are true biological gaps. They're actually the case. You don't, you, you're missing something, uh, and, and, uh, and they may actually be real. So examples of that are oxytrophies, uh, some cells and uh, we've seen examples of that. They learn how to live synergistically with other cells, and they have uh, a, an external source of a metabolite, and they may lose some of their genes, and they may lose the ability to make that metabolite, and they are two oxytrophs, so they will actually have incomplete pathways. So in that case, that's an example of a true gap. So a gap like that can, of course, always be assessed experimentally. You just uh, you know, su supplement the media and you know, see, see what's happening. There are some losses of genes that lead uh, to loss of function, and in the text we talk about uh, some E. coli strains that have lost the ability to make certain O antigens. The parts of the LPS on the outer membrane is just not made in some uh, E. coli because there's a gap in the uh, glycan uh, biosynthetic reactions, and they just can't make them. And so, of course, this is the basis for uh, antigen typing of strains in blood. They will have different set of glycans being made on the outside. And the, there's literally a missing uh, genetic basis for synthesizing those uh, antigens in a particular strain. So there are two gaps. We, we, we suspect, or we think there might be something supposed to be there because it looks like there are stops of a pathway there, but um, the gap in it may be real. So it's not always obvious that a gap requires gap filling uh, based on the information in the strain. 
So then there are what are called scope gaps. You try to calculate something, uh, but uh, the scope of the reconstruction doesn't uh, include that. And uh, you think you have a failure mode, but you really don't. And one of the uh, examples spoken about in the literature are gaps associated with uh, the E. coli reconstruction, AF1260, that includes the charging reactions of amino acids to tRNAs. So that reconstruction ends by an, an amino acid being made and it's put onto a tRNA. But since there's nothing on the other side that uses a tRNA for protein synthesis, that will look like a dead end. But it really isn't a dead end because if you couple it to a protein synthesis, it functions. So those kind of gaps are called scope gaps. And they're gaps, um, they result from the scope of the reconstruction uh, that has been put together. OK. So let's talk about then the computer-aided uh, hypothesis building. So here are uh, icons representing some uh, uh, algorithms that have uh, been published in the literature uh, aimed at filling these gaps. And we have two groups of them here. The ones to the left uh, uh, are algorithms that are uh, uh, used to find missing reactions. And those to the right are algorithms uh, used to find missing genes, trying to find the gene uh, uh, assignment to a function. And um, if you could talk about those on the left first, on the top is something called Be Nice. <clears throat> this was developed by Vasily Hatsi Marikaris. And um, blanking on her first name, all of a sudden, Broadbelt, her last name, while, while they were together at Northwestern University. And this is actually more than predicting one reaction, but a string of reactions, all the possible set of reactions between two metabolites. And this is the precursor to, I think, essentially all subsequent uh, pathway predictors. Most of the other methods we're going to talk about here predict one reaction. We try to miss one re missing reaction. But be nice actually predicts multiple reactions and therefore can be used to predict uh, pathways. Uh, gap fill uh, came out of uh, uh, Costas Maranis' lab. I think we mentioned that before. Smiley is an early, uh, actually probably the first gap filling uh, algorithm for a single reaction developed by Jenny Reed. Uh, growth match also came from Costas Maranis. And Omni, uh, that's something that Marcus Hergart actually developed. And then we have a number on the other side, uh, Seed. Uh, that's uh, 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 an approach that is, uh, relies on the uh, genome arrangement of prokaryotes. <coughs> Genomes are arranged in <coughs> operons, and they're often missing uh, gene function assignments in the middle of an operon. But if you look at a bunch of operons in related bacteria, you may have the function of that gene that is in the same place in the operon or nearby. So these are kind of genome neighborhood type uh, uh, predictors. And then Andometa that uses not just those sorts of things, but also uh, co-expression data and, and other information. And that algorithm was probably one of the very early algorithms that used multiple different data types to get at the same answer or, or to get that, you know, a missing function. So multiple uh, ways to argue for uh, gene assignment. So I believe these are the ones that are, uh, have been mostly used. Uh, this table may not be exhaustive, but it's certainly comprehensive in terms of what's been published in the literature. <coughs> I mean, the uses of methods published in the literature. So let's talk about predicting uh, reactions uh, to gap fill missing reactions. So here is one such algorithm. It was one of the early ones called Smiley. It was called Smiley because the way it was drawn first, it looked like a smiling face. <laughs> and you can imagine if you rotate that 45%, you could imagine the way it's laid out would, would have eyes and <laughs> a big smile. So I don't know that name stuck called Smiley. But the way it works, so it's an iterative loop. Uh, that is really a workflow, is a combination of computations, which are on the uh, left-hand side of that diagram, and then experiments that are on the right-hand side of the diagram. So the top middle, you may have a reconstruction that you're using to predict the outcome of a high-throughput uh, screen, phenotypic screen, and that's what's shown in the green box to the left. And we've talked about these before. These can be run for the wild-type strains or knockout strains or knockout 
strain collections. And when you uh, do the experiments and the computation, you overlay the two uh, to look for agreements and disagreements. And uh, in this icon, we see one red dot on that uh, plate there, which indicates a disagreement. But then you have a bunch of agreements. So you have one failure of prediction. And the failure of prediction here is prediction of no growth when there actually is growth. So something is missing in the reconstruction. And the algorithm that's shown below in the red box um, is an algorithm that goes into a universal um, collection of biochemical reactions and transporters and tries to find the minimum set of reactions you have to add into a reconstruction to make that gap go away. And uh, it's an MILP algorithm, so it will start with the simplest explanations. So this is really a way to computationally generate the most parsimonious hypothesis which is kind of interesting. And for every single case where this has been applied and led to discovery, that turns out to be the right hypothesis, which is also, of course, true, as you know, for a lot of experimental work. It's normally, the, you know, it's normally best to start with the most parsimonious hypothesis. So then if you look at the uh, icon to the bottom, you see a, one red arrow in there, which is a transporter. So uh, the prediction here may be that there was a missing transporter. So if you add that, to the uh, reconstruction that the red dot uh, goes away and you predict uh, that condition accurately. Now that will lead you to uh, some discoveries and um, uh, one of the first thing you can do is to use actually uh, collections of knockout strains to uh, examine this hypothesis. So you would take out of the uh, knockout collection a bunch of strains that have missing transporters that you think correspond to that red arrow and you repeat the experiment. And then if you get knockouts that actually don't show that failure mode, then now it's consistent with computation, these become of a special interest, and then you may take them into uh, expression uh, studies where you express the gene product and try to assess its functionality. And if you think you get a positive ID, uh, ID out of that, you can then update your reconstruction. So um, conceptually, I think, pretty clear. And it's an example uh, of a workflow <clears throat> that requires multiple different inputs to go to completion. And I think we mentioned this uh, in recent lectures that workflows like this have now become, I wouldn't say commonplace, but become recognized as being foundational to the practice of systems biology. So in other words, you need multiple computational methods and you need multiple experimental methods. You need to string them together into a workflow to get at the biological discovery that you're after. So this has been applied in a number of cases. <clears throat> and there's a table uh, uh, in the book that was prepared, I think, a couple of years ago or so, that gives examples of how approaches like this work. And they lead to the discovery um, of missing reactions <clears throat> in, um, in a reconstruction. So one of those is illustrated here. This is a very simple one. And this is the outcome of the uh, <coughs> SMILEY algorithm, uh, shown again there to the top right. So um, <coughs> it turns out that uh, um, the uh, uh, IJR904 uh, model of E. coli <coughs> could not grow on thymidine, was predicted not to grow on thymidine. But uh, when you did the experiments, <coughs> you see that the E. coli can grow on thymidine. And uh, the Smiley algorithm was run, <coughs> and it suggested that the simplest uh, explanation for why it can't grow on thymidine is a missing transporters. So the substrate is shown there <coughs> to the right. So it's a base with a pentose on it. Now, the, <coughs> the uh, um, algorithm predicts that the, if you can import that uh, um, molecule, and there's a transporter for that. Then it gets split in two into the pentose and the base. Now E. coli can't grow on this base, so this model can't grow on the base, but it certainly can grow on the pentose. So the prediction was, well, you can get a flux balance solution if you secrete the base. So if uh, thymine is just, if you import the thymine, split it into two, the pentose, and throw out the base and grow on the pentose, yeah, this error should go away. 
And this one was easy to test. What is shown in this diagram is the uh, exometabolome, if you will, just an extracellular assessment of the concentration of thymine and thymidine. And what you see there is just a linear uptake of the of, uh, thymidine and uh, linear secretion of thymine. And when you add them two up, you get that uh, a solid curve, so they are perfectly mass balanced. Nothing is disappearing. And the cell grows roughly at the growth rate that's predicted based on the pantos. So that was a very simple case. So there's a number of cases like this of discovery based on predictions in the literature, most of them a little more complicated than this one. So here's another algorithm we picked for uh, illustration here, the Omni, but mostly because of that figure there, it's so clear. Um, so if you have a failure mode, um, like um, we talked about before, and uh, that's shown in the cone in the, in, in the, to the bottom of that figure, the big one, where you have a yellow dot and a red dot, so the yellow dot is your prediction with your model, and the red dot is the observation. So uh, Omni is a bi-level optimization algorithm that illustrated in that black box to the bottom right. And you apply that so that you adjust the minimum number of reactions um, that will make the yellow point and the red point come close. And you can see the uh, column there of uh, icons to the far right that shows an algorithm trying to bring them close together until at the bottom they're essentially overlapping. So an algorithm like this may not be so much to uh, predict um, a missing reaction, but this predicts the use of reactions. In fact, this ex predicts expression state. All the reactions that are predicted to be active they might have a genetic basis and be leg legitimately there, but the algorithm can predict the expression state under those con conditions, um, so it inactivates a series of reactions to make the prediction of the computation uh, match. And in the paper, the Omni paper, there's an example uh, provided of that. So here's another algorithm that shapes a solution space to get a match between experiment um, and prediction, but maybe not so much for discovery of gene or reactions, but try to figure out which uh, reactions are actually active under that condition. Okay. Um, so those are um, two examples of algorithms used to discover uh, uh, reactions or the functionality of known reactions. Um, I guess I should elaborate a little bit. So, so the, the uh, 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 smiley algorithm and algorithms like that are trying to place reactions into a reconstruction to get something to happen. Omni may be on the other side. You know, it's trying to figure out which reactions are maybe downregulated and not activated under that condition. Okay, so let's talk a little bit then about predicting metabolic uh, uh, gene functions. So here is a, uh, an example from uh, a paper by um, Andre Osterman, who was at the Sanford Burnham uh, Institute. And uh, this example here speaks to the discovery of three genes in uh, Thermotoka maritima. And the ACID uh, algorithm uh, compares the genomic arrangements <coughs> of operons amongst multiple bacteria. And uh, that's what all these uh, gene maps uh, show uh, in the middle of the uh, diagram, these uh, panel in panel A. So you try to align them and compare them. And then you look at the, the uh, organism, uh, your target organism, where you're looking for gene function. And by comparing the uh, um, um, genome neighborhoods of other known functions, uh, you can identify an operon, and uh, there are uh, missing uh, annotations to genes in that operon. And by carrying out uh, this algorithm, uh, the pathway shown at the bottom uh, could be completed uh, in Thermotoka, uh, the genetic basis for it uh, discovered. So this relies on basically uh, uh, the fact that operons in bacteria tend to be organized in a particular way and that organization is often conserved between many bacteria, and you can, uh, you know, compare them and finger uh, uh, missing uh, gene functions. So, Andromeda, but I tend to pronounce Andromeda. Uh, there's a missing R in there. 
uh, is like that, but they uh, it uses multiple uh, data types. It uses gene co-expression, phylogenetic profiles, uh, chromosomal clustering, uh, also protein fusion, because often two genes that were two separate proteins uh, with evolution can be fused into one protein. So you, you, look, you look at information like that. And this example, uh, um, this came from uh, Uwe Sauer's lab but, uh, uh, at the uh, ETH, where they were finding, um, uh, I think, a missing a gene for activity uh, in the uh, TCA cycle in E. coli. That's somehow had diluted uh, discovery. And uh, it was found by using uh, uh, this algorithm and uh, the data types available, genes were suggested, and they um, uh, and the gene was found that they were after. Interesting example because this was a TCA cycle enzyme in uh, E. coli. Then there is the uh, one that was really impressive. This is a study that came out of uh, uh, Japan. Um, I think uh, Hirotada Mori's lab led this, um, and there were a number of other well-known Japanese labs involved in. Uh, in this effort. So they had made the KO collection in the mid 2000s, uh, a widely used uh, resource, where uh, all the uh, open reading frames that were uh, non-essential were deleted uh, and the deletion strain uh, generated. Um, they started um, comparing predictions um, FBA type predictions uh, of growth rate for these um, uh, knockout strains and found some odd inconsistencies all focused on the transaldolase basically uh, in uh, the TCA cycle. They then formed some double knockouts and even triple knockouts to try to interrogate this further. So they used you know, a combination of uh, model predictions and interpretation and the knockout technology to do a very deep dive into, into these discrepancies. And the bottom line of that is shown uh, in this diagram. This is a great paper to read, uh, uh, actually. So if I remind you first about the glycolytic reaction. So fructose 6-phosphate you know, is a sugar, 6-carbon sugar, and it's phosphorylated on one end. And um, phosphofructokinase phosphorylated on the other end to make one 6 this phosphate. And actually it's an interesting molecule because it's, it's symmetric and it's probably, um, well, at least in carbohydrate metabolism is the most, is the highest energy containing molecule, uh, carefully regulated and regulates a lot of things. So it's one six bis phosphate. Now in uh, uh, the pathos pathway, there is that molecule S7 uh, phosphate set heptulose or something like that, <laughs> seven phosphate. So it is a seven carbon sugar that's phosphorylated in the seventh position. And one of the things that came out of this uh, study was the prediction that phosphofructokinase was actually able to put phosphate group on the other end of that molecule in the one position to form one seven, you know, base phosphate, just like one six base phosphate of fructose but it was just one carbon longer. And <clears throat> that was shown to be the case. You can clone the phosphofructokinase and do the enzyme activity, and indeed that was the case. Uh, well, not indeed, but that was found to be the case. Um, then, you know, uh, the normal glycolysis uh, has uh, fructose-based uh, phosphate split into two trioses. And then there's that uh, isomerase that basically makes them both into GAP, and GAP goes, uh, uh, a three carbon sugar uh, goes down glycolysis. But if you take 1,7, the 1,7 uh, base phosphate, if you cleave that with that aldolase, and the aldolase was found to have that activity, you create a three carbon and a four carbon. And it turns out that the four carbon unit is erythrose four phosphate, that is the natural metabolite to the pentose pathway. And the other one goes into glycolysis and down. So, so two reactions added to the reconstruction based on this. Totally surprising reactions, a priori, but in retrospect, maybe not that surprising. So um, a couple of points uh, uh, 
to make here. One is that commonly known pathways, even like you know, glycolysis in the pentose pathway in E. coli, may not be fully elucidated. They may still have capabilities that we don't know about, and these capabilities showed up as a result of uh, error in prediction. And the prediction, of course, is made on um, a reconstruction that represents what we think we know. The second point to make here is that there was no change in uh, the GPRs uh, here. The change is in a reaction association to a known protein. So this is addition to the proteome reactome association. And that's what we've been talking about there a few times lately. That association is hard to make. And here's a discovery of that. And more generally speaking, um, this is uh, this issue of the underground metabolism uh, that has come into the forefront recently, namely that many of these reactions <coughs> may have, may, many of these enzymes may have the ability to uh, uh, catalytically uh, uh, convert uh, substrates that are similar to the primary substrate. And that can be good or bad. Um, in, the, uh, in this case, it's good, clearly. But I think I've also mentioned, but I'll do it again, uh, the case of isocitrate dehydrogenase in humans. So there's a mutation that can happen in, in that enzyme that leads to a gain of function. It'll take another substrate that is very similar to the natural substrate and catalyze it into a product that's very you know, similar to the product it naturally makes. But that's a dead-end metabolite. And there's no place to go. And it builds up. And it actually uh, mocks up the function of um, DNA methyltransferases. And it changes the methylation state of the DNA and that is believed to be a causative event in many uh, tumors now. A simple mutation in a core metabolic enzyme like isocitrate dehydrogenase may lead to a gain of function. A new reaction shows up in the reactome that shouldn't be there. And that'll catalyze, uh, that will that'll lead to the formation of a metabolite that has no place to go and mocks things up in a bad way. So just a few comments about this proteome reactome association and how important that is. Okay, so summarize here. Um, when we have discrepancies between experimental outcomes and predictions, uh, we can study that discrepancy and that can lead to discovery of uh, missing parts uh, in, a, in a reconstruction. Um, there are two types of gaps that the literature has focused on, uh, finding missing reactions and finding missing genes. And there is a suite of algorithms available for both cases. Um, um, so, uh, so this suite of algorithm is actually diverse. Uh, it uh, takes different approaches and uses different data sources. So there's, there's not one solution to this problem. And if you have a gap, it's probably advisable to look at more than one of them to see if you have uh, you know, the best assessment uh, uh, of that gap uh, possible. There is a growing number of studies uh, to do this. Um, and gap uh, filling is happening. Um, one of my favorite uh, studies out of that table uh, uh, is associated with gluconate uh, kinase uh, on the human genome. So when Recon 1 came out, uh, it couldn't metabolize gluconate. There's a lot of gluconate in food. If you look at the labels on the food you buy in the store, you will see gluconate. And it's sometimes actually a food additive. And it was surprising that the knowledge of its metabolism was incomplete. It was kind of surprising. And a gap filling study, uh, I think actually using Smiley, uh, suggested a gene or two, I think, on the human genome, one of which was found to be gluconate kinase. So it takes gluconate and makes phosphogluconate out of it. And I know how uh, well you remember your biochemistry, but 6-phosphogluconate is uh, intermediate in the pentose pathway. So gluconate goes that way, it makes CO2 in a pentose. Um, I would, uh, ahead of time, have thought that it would somehow be scrambled or something would happen and it would end up in glycolysis. So things like that can be uh, discovered now systematically. Um, the automated uh, reconstruction uh, algorithms that are being uh, made, like model seed, that is based on seed in part, I try now to incorporate that in there. So during the automated state uh, stage of uh, making a reconstruction, the reconstruction fails certain computational tests, 
you try to automatically fill in the gaps and you, so you don't have to do it manually. That means that you make it a list of candidate uh, gap filling uh, um, outcomes and you manually go through them and curate them. So you don't have to generate that list uh, as you go through a reconstruction manually, but some suggestions can be provided uh, uh, to you. So that's the end of this topic, but this is a topic that I think shows uh, uh, a practical use of reconstructions to uh, direct discovery, biological discovery.